So today we're going to talk about dams, how we alter water levels, how we alter water resources. Guys, quiet down. So the main idea here, okay, we're looking at how humans alter water resources, right? So lakes, rivers, streams. Well, a lot of times we change them so that we prevent flooding or we prevent them ruining our homes and that type of thing. So we're going to talk about levees, dikes, and dams. Levees and dikes are both used to prevent flooding, okay? This is a picture of a levee. Notice, it's just a river with a bank that's built up, okay? So levee is just an enlarged bank built up on each side of a river, okay? And so that's important because it's going to prevent any flooding. Imagine if there was a whole bunch of snow that melted or a big heavy rain. This river is not going to overflow then. The problem with that is that we no longer have any of that nutrient-rich water that's coming over the banks and providing nutrients to the shoreline. So normally when it floods, we're going to get a lot of nutrient-rich soil deposited on the land. We're not going to get that anymore. The other thing, too, is the Mississippi River, for example, has a ton of levees, okay, a ton of enlarged banks so that it doesn't flood. The problem is, is it's not the whole length of the river. And a lot of times we'll put a levee on one part of the river, but not the whole river. So what happens when the water gets down to the part of the river that doesn't have a levee? Then it floods, right? So while it can prevent flooding in one area, it might just move it someplace else, OK? Um, this is helpful because in areas that normally get flooded, we could now develop them because we don't have to get uh, we don't have risk of flooding there. So we can now build houses without having to worry about, you know, flooding on the river, okay? So levee, enlarged bank, all right? We also have dikes. These are the same exact thing as levees, but instead of a river, it's along a uh, body of salt water, okay? So these would be like little like canals, coming from the ocean. Um, Holland has a ton of dikes because Holland is below sea level, okay? So what they have to do is they have to build up their coastline with all of these uh, levees and all of these dikes because if there's ever any kind of tropical storm, or well, they're not in the tropics, if there's any kind of storm or any kind of flooding event, um, they're gonna be the first to be affected. And so Holland or the Netherlands is one of the ones that's going to be affected by climate change if the sea levels rise because they're literally below sea level. We can also have these levees or these dikes break. You might have heard of that a lot of times with hurricanes. Sometimes they'll break and then it causes a lot of chaos, right? So a lot of damage as well. So dams are another way that humans alter rivers and waterways. A dam is just a barrier, barrier that runs across a stream or river. And we put it there to control the flow of water so that it prevents flooding and so that we can use it to generate electricity. That's why most dams are created. Um, they can provide more water. Like let's say there's a whole lot of farming up here at this part of the river, they can dam it, and then they get a whole bunch of river water um, there to provide water for their crops, okay? Can also be useful for fishing, can provide drinking water for people up here. And then downstream, we get less flooding, okay? But the things that we don't see is that we're obviously displacing people or ruining habitats when we flood this area. Um, and it can other, have other unintended consequences at well, as well. So when we dam a river, normally our river would be this nice little skinny river. And when we dam it, we put this barrier in front of it, it floods. And so we get a big lake behind the dam. And this is called a reservoir. It's the body of water that's created from damming that river. And you can kind of see the picture 
down below here. Right, here's our dam. What did we say we needed in order to make any kind of electricity? We said steam, what does the steam do? Turns the turbine. Well, in this case, we don't have steam, steam turning a turbine, we just have the water turning the turbine. Okay, and it's able to generate electricity. So you'll see here's our reservoir, here are our power lines, and we can generate electricity from this dam. We're gonna do a whole case study on a dam um, on Monday, a dam in China that's been super controversial, uh, and we'll talk about why in a minute. Uh, it's the Yangtze River, yeah. So one of the dams uh, that they've actually created is in Lake Powell in Utah. So if you check out this dam, right, we've got the dam here, we've got the reservoir, and one of the things that we notice with this dam is um, sometimes we can have unintended consequences and what's happened with this dam is the water levels have actually decreased a ton over time. So I'm just going to show you the time lapse. So this is in the Rocky Mountains, okay? And the reason that they wanted to dam this was to prevent uh, a reliable supply of water for California. Um, so what they did is they have this dam and uh, we're going to see what happened okay, as a result of this dam. So notice, here is our river. Notice it's starting to get brown here, right? So it's drying up. So one of the problems then is dams end up drying up rivers, especially downstream, that used to be really full, okay? And all of the organisms that depend on these rivers are going to be affected as well. And you'll notice in different seasons, sure, it, it um, fills back up, but we now have just a tiny fraction of the amount of water here that we used to because it's all been diverted to California where they need it, right? We're, this is the dam we're going to look at on Monday. So it's the Three Gorges Dam. This is the nice little pretty river. And then they put a dam here. Notice how it flooded this area. This is the reservoir. And we're going to talk about the impacts, the good, the bad, the ugly, on Monday. So we're going to skip pros and cons of dams until we do the case study, okay, on Monday. So one of the problems with dams is that the little fishies that need to migrate, especially salmon, Salmon have to migrate. They migrate every year to go breed in, um, and so they need to be able to get up and down these rivers, okay? Well, if we build a dam, they can't go through the dam, and so that's a problem. So some really environmentally friendly dams are now requiring fish ladders, okay? I'll show you a video of one in a sec. And it's to help fish migrate across the dam so they can get to breeding grounds. So our little fish can jump. You guys have seen fish jump, and they basically like little jump up this little ladder all the way through to the dam. <laughs> Make a fish ladder. Yeah. So let's check out some of these uh, fish ladders because I think they look kind of fun. All right. So we're going to take a peek. Oh, I already fast forwarded it. These fishies are kind of cute. So they just jump up, right? So salmon jump. Yes, because the water is obviously flowing down. So they have to go against like upstream, but it's better than like not being able to go to the breeding ground. You might ask, well, how do they know? Well, you know, it's the same way that sea turtles know how to go to the um, see when they're hatched, right? They just have this scent. So they just climb up these little fish ladders, right? And so this is something we can encourage more dams to do because most dams don't have something like this. Um, but it's one thing that they do a lot in the Pacific Northwest because the fish, uh, the salmon, there's a lot of salmon up there. All right. So fish ladders, positive thing that we can add to dams to help mitigate the negative impacts.
All right. So um, one of the other problems, as you'll see, this is the, I have ARLC case study. We're not going to write anything for this at the moment. Um, one of the things with the RLC, it was dammed, and as you can see, a lot of it's drying up. So when we dam an area, a lot of the uh, a lot of the sea or the river downstream is going to end up drying up. Okay, and one of the problems with this is that the salt level increases. So as something shrinks, right, the salt level gets higher and higher. And that's one of the problems we had here with the RLC. We'll talk more about that later. All right, so um, how do we get water to people, right? We can get it via uh, dams, like we can help channel it into certain areas. And one of the things that they do is they use aqueducts. This was from Roman era, okay, used with the Roman Empire. This is a picture of like an aqueduct. This is an open one. But in ancient times, it was literally just a canal that would carry water from one place to another, okay? So like to your house or to a city. Nowadays, they have something like that. It's like underwater, um, and it's just pipes that are able to carry water from one location to another. Now, some of the problems, sometimes there's conflicts over who ends up getting the water, um, not necessarily in the U.S., but in other countries. Um, because let's say, for example, you are in, like, I don't know, pick a country. You're in where? Afghanistan. And you decide that you're going to run an aqueduct from Pakistan from Pakistan's water reservoir or Pakistan's lake to your country, right? So there's some problems like that that happen overseas. They can also still disturb natural habitats as well because we are creating these man-made structures. All right, last but not least, we've talked about how 97% of the water on Earth is salt water, and fresh water is in high demand. We can't water our crops with salt water. We can't drink salt water, so it's a problem. So how do we get more fresh water? There isn't really a really good way of getting more fresh water, okay? Some people are like, well, we can just take the salt out of it. Well, yeah, we can. Here's the problem. It's called desalinization, removing salt from salt water. It used to be super expensive. It's getting cheaper, but it takes a ton of energy. Anyone have a plastic water bottle, like a disposable plastic water bottle? Okay. On your plastic water bottle, usually you can find somewhere that says produced by blah, blah, blah. And usually you can find the words reverse osmosis. So most water bottles are going to say water is purified by reverse osmosis. Okay. So we can distill water or we can use reverse osmosis. Okay. Both of them require a lot of energy and a lot of effort. To distill it, okay, what we do is we boil it and then all the steam is captured. Anyone ever um, put away something warm in a Tupperware and then all the like condensation gets on the lid? Yeah. Same idea, right? You'd capture all that condensation and then be able to drink it, right? So in this scenario, we have to take a ton of water, we boil it, and then the steam is basically condensed and it goes into regular, it's just regular water then, okay? Because remember with the water cycle, when water evaporates, it's only the water, it's not the steam. And then reverse osmosis, it just forces it. Remember osmosis is moving through a membrane from high concentration to low concentration. It's just water is forced through a membrane and the water can pass through this screen, but the salt can't, okay? And then we have problems with, well, what do we do with all the leftover salt? all the really leftover salty water, okay? It's not good for a whole lot. So those are some of the things that um, we talk about. Today, you are going to go to these two links, all right? You are going to be able to see different uh, states and what they use water for, and you're going to analyze their uh, water use. And then you're going to go to Wisconsin, and you're going to see what Wisconsin uses a lot of water for as well.